Yeah. 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 It's not the one that's posted on the web. I don't want to do one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I call to order the regular work session for the Sierra Vista City Council for July 11th. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation today. And Chewy, did you get all your fan club members here? Uh, they didn't want to come. They didn't want to come. <laughs> okay. Chuck, do you can introduce this one? Sure, I can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, uh, we just uh, have on the agenda a, a chance to... Uh, show a, a video uh, put on by the International City County uh, Management Association uh, called Life Well Run Community Hero. Uh, as you're aware, uh, the council honored uh, Chewy Estrada uh, a couple months ago with uh, receiving uh, the Community Hero Award. And they put together a little video on his behalf as well. Uh, as I was just mentioning to the council before the meeting, uh, Chewy's one of uh, three employees that's actually been here longer than me. So uh, we have a pact to uh, retire together someday, but uh, who knows, maybe our wives will, will get in the way of that. But uh, <laughs> none, nonetheless, uh, Chewy is, uh, you know, I consider the finest refuse truck driver in the United States. I don't think there's even any question about that. And I think this uh, video will show uh, what kind of a public uh, servant uh, and man that he is. So please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm here every single day, every single day, and I've done it for 33 years. People that I've known for so many years in service stuff, they kept telling me, you're still working for the city? And I said, yeah, I'm still at it. The city needs me, you know, because I'm up there trying to keep the city clean and keep the city going. So this way, if they see us do a good job out there, people will come and live here in service the more. You gotta have pride in your service especially in service. When I'm on my routes, I like to talk to people, especially the kids. They love to see the truck operate. I always jump out. I never talk from the window. And I let them, once in a while, push buttons or hit the horn so they'll say, hey, I was in one of the garbage trucks. Back in 84, when I first started for the city, I started as a helper on the route. When I memorized the routes, then they gave me a truck, a used one. When I started cleaning it, washing it, inside and out, then the mechanics were amazed. And they say, we don't, we don't have anybody like you around here. So from there, I just took off and I started taking more pride on, on my trucks. From 84 to 2017, as you can see, my truck is still spotless. This is the best job I ever had. We're here for, for the community, not just for us, for ourselves. You know, just to go out there and do the job and go home, uh-uh. It makes me feel good, you know, it makes me feel proud to what I'm doing. We're out there to help the community. That's a great. That's a great video, Chewy. We we all take pride in you too, and, we, and uh, we're glad you're here to, to work with us in the city. So thanks. Thank you. That video will be on Channel 12. Well, it's available. Yeah, it'll be available anytime we show this meeting on TV or on the net. So you're going to be world famous now, Chewy. Escape. Thank you. Escape. There you go. All right. We're not going to ask you to speak today, Chewy. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll next move on to item B, which is the uh, council meeting ahead of us. And uh, obviously we'll start with the pledge and prayers we usually do. We have the Leisure Library em employees. We have uh, David gets his uh, annual awards for his uh, his financial reporting. Uh, and I shouldn't say that just David, the entire finance group does, does a lot of work, and the budget folks do a lot of work. Uh, Chuck's going to talk to us about open meeting, uh, upcoming meetings, open bids. Uh, the first item really is a public hearing item uh, on the amending Chapter 94 of the Parks and Re declaring it a, a 
public 30-day public record. Ms. Yarborough, do you have a staff report for us, please? I do, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The Parks and Recreation Ordinance was last updated about four years ago, and there's a couple of reasons why we're bringing it forward with some changes again at this time. The Parks and Recreation Commission asked to review it this year, and so we spent a few months reviewing it and considering their recommendations, and staff took the opportunity to look and see what changes needed to be made or things that have come up over the past four years as well. So one of the things that the Parks and Recreation Commission recommended was updating the definition of smoking. And so we updated that to match the definition in the Smoke Free Arizona Act and add the term vapor product. And one of their major recommendations was to recommend the prohibition of smoking and vaping within 50 feet of sports fields and playgrounds. There's a lot of consideration that went into this, and the primary reason that prompted this review was knowing that Fort Huachuca began significantly reducing smoking areas on post as part of Army-wide community health improvement initiatives, and so the Parks and, Rec Com Parks and Rec Commission brought that up to consider what recommendation to make. Um, the city helped with doing a survey to assess how the community would respond to a change like this. And so the survey was advertised through Facebook in September and October of last year. We put it in the city's email newsletter. The survey was mentioned on the radio. What came back was that it had reached a total of 4,003 people. It received 302 reactions, comments, shares, uh, 529 clicks of the survey link, and 105 total comments. There were 139 responses, and the difference there is that somebody could um, click their choice but not necessarily make a comment. So there were 139 votes. 94 of those votes favored banning uh, smoking at all parks. 104 supported banning smoking and vaping at sports fields. And upon considering this information, the Parks and Rec Commission decided to recommend just the banning of smoking and vaping at sports fields and playgrounds, feeling that a ban of smoking in parks, period, would be very difficult to enforce. We also looked at the definition of malt beverages, and staff realized that this was something of an oversight, primarily because it only covered malt beverages. It didn't cover a lot of different types of alcohol. And so we changed the definition to that of spirituous liquor, which is the definition that the Arizona Liquor Board uses. So that update now covers all beverages containing alcohol and their permitted consumption in the parks. We looked at the definition and added one for mobile food vendors. Um, the intent here was due to some specific circumstances that have arisen over the past few years, primarily with evening sporting events. The um, concession stand in or near the sports fields is generally run by the Little League and soccer organizations as a fundraiser for their um, organization. So our intent is not to allow uh, mobile food vendors to impact that, but there was a gap in evening sports activities where games go late into the night and no food was available. And so what this change would allow is for some specific circumstances, like the one I just described, being able to allow mobile food vendors to operate with specific guidelines under a specific process. Um, and consider over the next um, month before this would go into effect um, what that process would be. The Parks and Rec Commission also requested specifically that the definition of model aircraft was updated to unmanned aircraft to match the FAA de definition of unmanned aircraft. And the use of Mo or model aircraft, mo unmanned aircraft was already not permitted in parks, so updating to unmanned aircraft didn't really change anything. The, by state law, most or restrictions on model aircraft or unmanned aircraft are not permitted unless a municipality has a specific area designated for unmanned aircraft use, which the city has with Bolin Airfield, and so we are permitted to not permit um, unmanned aircraft in our city parks. Is Bolin, is that airfield accessible to the public? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Mr. Mount. It is out um, off of Charleston Road. It's there's a just past the high school. There's a sign that says Bullen Airfield with a sign. It's uh, it's sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. The the facility is fairly nice. We've we've got pads set up. Uh, we've got uh, tables set up for people to work on their aircraft. There's a landing strip. There's a parking area. Um, so I would say it is fairly accessible. Okay, and and pretty much people can just show up, set up, and start doing their hobbying. It is there. absolutely open use at any time. Okay, that's works Thanks within so. the boundaries of park hours. I, w- I was only going to add. Uh, and I, I had thought about this a couple of days ago, uh, that field and um, the uh, Frisbee Golf, are they well advertised as city uh, facilities? Uh, Councilmember Calhoun, they are on our list of uh, parks mm-hmm. and um, other or our recreational facilities. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say that we are planning to better advertise those. Uh, we're working on upgrading the website with more photos of the specific um, parks and, and recreational use areas. So they are included, and we're working on making them more discoverable. That's great, because and I guess it's a little off topic, but um, I was driving past the Frisbee Golf one, and I saw four or five cars parked there, and I thought, wow, you know, folks are, are really using this area, and I just wondered how, how many people really know about it. So. Thank you. We made a small change with parking. I combined all of the vehicle-related guidelines under the motor vehicles section. One of the things that has become more of a problem over the past few years is people parking on the grass around Ramadas. And so in conversation with the team we pulled together to review this um, ordinance, the police representative pointed out that without being a civil traffic violation, it was difficult to enforce um, people parking on the grass around the Ramadas. When people do that, it damages the grass, it damages the irrigation, they run over sprinkler heads, and so it's become more and more expensive to fix that damage created. And so what we did is just move that under the motor vehicle section and then updated the penalty portion to make any motor vehicle violation in a park, a potential civil traffic offense. Those are the major changes to the ordinance. The Park and Recreation Commission reviewed all changes at their meeting on June 20th, and they recommended approval of the updated ordinance, and I would welcome any further questions. So uh, I think the references to the Ramada are the things that go on, like at Tompkins Park, where there's limited parking, and they kind of pull up around that one picnic table areas? Yes, Mr. Mount. Right. Is there going to be, ever since I've been here, I've seen that's kind of been the status quo. Will there be some grace period, uh, an education process, something before we start just laying the hammer down on that, so to speak? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Mount, um, Chief Thrasher is welcome to jump in, but I can say (laughs) 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 from what I have heard, Um, our police do a great job of stopping and talking to folks first, letting them know that it's, it's a problem and that, um, they shouldn't be parking on the grass. It's just that there was no teeth in the ordinance if they put up or made an argument to have any enforcement behind it if necessary. So I I think the real problem that could come up with this is clearly people are parking in the grass because some of these parks don't have a lot of parking and they've paid to use the Ramada and they have people showing up to do that and there's just no parking. How do we overcome the key problem, which is enabling people to use this for their parties or whatnot, but then having suitable amount of parking for them to actually have the party for the Ramada that they rented? And I'm not asking for like an immediate answer now, but that's, that's gonna be the problem that we have to fix. That is certainly an issue, particularly in parks like Tompkins Park. Um, However, what we have seen the primary issue be is more, I want to pull my truck up and unload things right next to the Ramada. People not wanting to carry items over and not as much a parking um, availability issue. So we've kept an eye on it over the past four years. And so the, the change comes out of seeing it become more and more 
of it looks like there's plenty of parking available, but more people have pulled their trucks up right beside the Ramada and don't want to walk from the parking lot over to the Ramada. Okay, that's a fair point. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. When these items are public hearing, um, it's advertised in the paper as a public hearing item. And uh, is there any other way that folks are contacted to let them know an issue that may be of particular interest to them is uh, coming up for review or discussion? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Calhoun, we don't specifically reach out to any groups to say, here's a heads up um, that the parks ordinance is up for review. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one more question you mentioned, and I think I missed, uh, I didn't hear what you said about the process for food trucks on sports fields. Is it already delineated in, this, in the document we have, what the process is? No, Mrs. Calhoun, we will be developing the, the process. Okay. It will be relatively simple, but between now and when the ordinance actually goes into effect, we'll have the process developed and in place. Okay, and are you depending on the public? Are you not depending on them, but hoping that it, you'll get comments and input from the public on this before the actual ordinance is written? We always hope that. Okay, thank you. But I can say that I, I have been, part of the reason why that is in there is because I have been contacted by a number of mobile food vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heard from the, particularly the, the adult leagues are the ones that play in the evening, that there's a lack of food. And we can't have a lack of food. <laughs> Got to have that food. Yes, Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, ma'am, uh, you said that this has come out of the Parks and Rec Commission. How long have they been working on these revisions? Um, I don't have an exact month when they started, but it was, I'd say, last summer we started looking at it. And this, the entire, they support the entire revision and they've been working on it for quite some time? They do. Okay. Anybody on this side? Yeah, just yes, a short comment. I did want to say that I really appreciated seeing um, the, uh, the smoking ban on Facebook. I thought that was a great use of a tool to reach different people. And I did also enjoy reading all the, the comments. So thank you for, for using that medium as well. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Yarborough. We'll next move on to, uh, I guess, item number three and four, kind of linked, and it deals with our CDGB. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, will you give us a staff report, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, members of council, the resolution before you identifies those projects you wish to designate for funding in this year's annual action plan and commencing the 15-day public review period on the draft annual action plan. At your March 21st work session, you heard presentations from staff and outside agencies on various funding requests submitted uh, for next year's round of community development block grant funding totaling $236,107. Uh, this is $17,692 more than the city received last year. Uh, based on the council's discussion and direction, we're recommending that the annual action plan provide $15,000 in funding uh, to the Boys and Girls Club for before and after school program scholarships, $80,000 for improving the alleyway between 1st and 2nd Streets in the Fry Town site to better control drainage, $66,107 towards curb gutter and sidewalk construction and the 5th Street North right away adjoining the eastern boundary of the Christian House Fellowship property, and $75,000 uh, for stormwater improvements and park upgrades to Timothy Park in the Sulger neighborhood. During the tentative uh, project selection discussion, we had proposed setting aside a portion of the community development block grant funds for demolition and removal of dilapidated trailers in connection with the replacement with new manufactured or site-built homes. After that meeting, I learned from the owner of Clayton Homes that there would be demand for such program and that they average about 10 to 15 homes in the city per year. In addition, we had a meeting uh, with a couple who recently purchased a property in the Fry Town site on the southeast corner of 4th Street and Tacoma who are interested in redeveloping the site. They are looking for assistance to clear out five blighted structures to make way for three brand new manufactured home units, each on their own lot. We think that this would be a worthy project that would make a huge difference on that corner. Uh, for your consideration as an alternate uh, recommendation, we suggest you consider setting aside $15,000 towards establishing a blight removal 
uh, fund by reducing the alleyway project by 5,000 and the Timothy Park project by 10,000. So what we're looking for here is a final selection of projects to include in the resolution and the draft annual action plan, which will be presented to you for a final approval hearing on August 10th, along with any public comments that are received during the uh, review period. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to you for a selection of the final projects. So let me, let me ask you this. We may, we're still under budget on all, all the things you mentioned whether we do the whether we do the, the swaps or not for the add the new project, we're still under budget for CDGB. For okay, so for Timothy Park, uh, uh, the to we're I'm, talking, I'm talking total total numbers. Right. We're still we still expend all CDGB funds that we've been allocated by by those all those projects. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Because that wasn't one thing that was clear in the past. We've got basically a list of the projects to the amount of money we were supposed to have and uh, and what was what was previously discussed and what was going to be recommended by staff. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, as you recall, you had already met uh, to discuss the various projects yep. and the mix. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin has put that together in the action plan and we've attached specific numbers now to those projects for estimates. We did not have that. Part. You didn't have the estimates before. But the bottom line, my question, I guess, is your estimates meet the total number of money that were allocated by the, the yes. government for the CDGB program? Yes, the allocation for next year is $236,107. And if you look at the recommended projects on page five of the memo, you'll see it equals those, that those allocation. Are the, those are the same, and those are the same projects that we uh, discussed earlier. No change. Uh, Timothy Park is a new project okay. uh, that was uh, added since your last uh, work session on this. Okay, uh, and the other the other question then is today what you're asking us to do is consider adding a, a another project where we take ten thousand from one project and five thousand for another project to add the money for this for this uh, mobile home I'm demolition fund. Home. Demolition fund. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And Mr. Mayor, I just want to point out that uh, the Timothy Lane project is very important, uh, as we've discussed before, drainage in, in Solger, and this is uh, hopefully at least a, a partial solution to helping us with that. With and, that and, I, and I think we fully understand that uh, when Solger was originally built in the county, it was built in kind of a bowl, and part of the part of the way the bowl is fed is through the south with Timothy Lane Park, and the others from the east side. And we have to kind of address both the south side, the east side, and then get properties to drain the bottom of the bowl and, and move the water north. And that's going to take some time some time to do. And it may be multiple projects to be able to do that. I understand that. Yes, ma'am. I just have a couple of questions. Um, so we have for sure, we are for sure that the CDBG money is not being cut from the federal budget this year. We, the, the number that's uh, quoted is uh, from an official estimate provided by U.S. Department of Housing. And we Urban we did get an official notice from the, the from the uh, federal government that we have X amount. I don't remember what, what it was. It's the one that's in the in the pamphlet. Two hundred thirty-six, yeah. one hundred. That has been that has been allocated for this year. Okay. There's still there's still discussion going on. I've been reading about this through the through the mayor's association uh, as to whether or not. We will, there will be a CDG pro, CDGB program for next, next year. Well, 18's allocation would be funded to, right. coming up, and that's that's in question right now. Okay. But this is this is last year's 17 money that has been allocated. Okay. So my next question, Matt, is taking funds away from two of the other projects um, to do demolition of the uninhabitable homes, is that going to make it so that they can't complete the projects that we're taking the money? Do they still have enough money to complete their projects? Please. We won't know until the bids come in, but it'll just affect the design of, of what gets included in those projects. So in other words, you're gonna make it We'll work. design it to the budget okay. that you all set. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and forgive me, I might have just misunderstood what you were saying about getting rid of the uninhabitable homes. Is that something that we're doing as the city, or are you farming that out to another group of people? 
we would manage the program. Basically, we would make the funds available for under certain guidelines, and that again would be for the demolition, the removal of existing dilapidated units in exchange for the replacement of brand new manufactured homes uh, that are affordable under the uh, HUD guidelines. So is this something that would be, um, and I guess what I, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate my question. So are we making sure that this is going to be something that is for the city, or is it something that we're giving to people that are going to benefit privately? The public benefit would be the creation of quality, affordable housing, and that's one of the central goals of uh, the CDBG program. Uh, it, and it's accomplished in part by making the economics more feasible for these uh, investors or property owners to replace their existing older units with uh, newer uh, manufactured homes or site-built homes. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Wolf, uh, uh, getting to your question, uh, what we're trying to do is establish a program whereby anybody can benefit from it as opposed to just looking at a specific project. Obviously, if we looked at a specific project for with specific benefit to somebody, we would be in violation of the gift cost. So we would actually have to have a program that was available citywide. Can we... Yeah, I, I think I'm following kind of where you're going with some of this. I, I am concerned that maybe the optics would be that the city is taking away somebody's old trailer and the taxpayers uh, at any level are paying for a new trailer and ultimately where is the supply chain so who is the person who is buying that trailer who is the person who is receiving that trailer uh what is the you know that's just something i think that i'd like to have a little bit more clarity on as you start to establish this project i i don't have a clue as to how many different people in the city are managing trailer parks but i can't imagine it that it's dozens so I'm worried about the competitiveness of, of how this thing gets worked out I don't think we want to get involved in building new no. trailer parks no I agree with that but that's what it sounds like well no. what we're doing. I, I just be involved in is getting rid of the dilapidated my re stuff. recollection of the last work session on this subject was there some hesitation because we weren't sure what the potential demand was so I explored you know, what is the potential likelihood of somebody tapping into this program? And it really keys in on the two uh, objectives of HUD in that slum and blight removal and the creation of affordable housing. Right. So and those are the public What goals. was the demand? What were the actual numbers that you got back? Well, again, just from that survey, I mean, 15,000 isn't going to go a long way yeah. when we're talking about two or three units. And that would be a pilot program. And our estimation is that there would be demand to expend that amount of funding in the next program. Would year. that amount of funding come out of the same CDGB block grants that we normally get? Would that start to consume the total pie, so to speak, so that some of these other projects would be harder to accomplish? Or would this be new funding from somewhere else? It would be uh, a portion of next year's appropriation for CDBG program, and whether you continue it is a decision you make on an annual basis. Yeah, it's a council decision as to as to whether we would do that, and I don't think it's also a council decision as, as to whether we would appropriate appropriate additional funds outside the CDG program to do that. Right. So I think I think it, if it's successful, if there's still a need, it's a point that's worthy of discussion. Whether we decide collectively to continue to pursue it is is another question but this is right. this is essentially a a pilot test program to see if in fact this this helps uh, meet the two criteria that that Matt mentioned and I would say that it also is just kind of a continuation of the cleanup we're already doing right I mean it's okay. what was the address again of the those three the corner of well the couple we met with uh, and again, this would be open to anybody, but this is another example of a potential project is on the southeast corner of Tacoma and 4th Street. Okay, thank you. So would we be, if we put money or funds towards this area and um, demolished those, would this couple, then they are going to in turn purchase that property from us? Is that how it works? They own the property. They own the property. And there are five dilapidated units on it. And they would redevelop the site 
with three new manufactured homes each. They would subdivide the property into three lots and convert a park into uh, three manufactured home sites. Well, why, why not, instead of us adding another project to our plate, so to speak, why wouldn't this not be something that we would just turn over to Habitat or somebody who already does similar like actions and just let them deal with it? I, my, my, my concern here is that we don't have a lot of money and it's a pilot program. And it almost sounds like, unless we see this whole thing blown out, I don't want there to be the optics that we're picking winners and losers of who's going to get a new house. I, that I have some concerns with. I don't know if this is sustainable that the next wave of people think, well, Johnny and Susie down the street got a new house because they just happened to be at the door when we knocked. And now what we do is we have a tidal wave of people moving in who all think that they're going to get a new house too. I, I think those are some valid concerns. I, I don't know if we're prepared to handle that. Well, I, I just want to want to say the way I'm the way I'm reading this is a little differently. Yeah, is that you haven't pre-picked. You use these guys as an example. The the five dilapidated evidence with of three, potential demand as a as a potential demand example. Uh, you haven't. You, we haven't signed any documents with these people. We would have to advertise the program. We would have to uh, evaluate uh, the applications, and basically, at that point, then we would take the best ones we thought we had. Of, of meeting the two criteria from from the uh, the HUD program, Mr. Mayor, if sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. I'm not sure if you're finished. Um, so I may be missing something, but I'm just I I don't understand how this is fundamentally different from previous partnerships we've had with the city and county, specifically the Fry Town site cleanup that removed 35 dilapidated trailers and was lauded by the citizens of Fry Town site and I think the community at large. So if you could maybe understand what I might be missing. Well, through that agreement, we ended up owning the property. So that there's a distinction there. Uh, uh, city manager mentioned the gift clause because we were ultimately the owner of that property. Uh, we were able to use public funds and the cleanup of that property. Here, uh, we're using federal funds, and this is a customary use of community development block grant funds to remediate slum and blight conditions and accomplish affordable housing goals. Um, and so there is a private party involved, but there is a public purpose to the use of the federal funds to uh, accomplish those ends. And I, and I can, I, appreciate the concern about the optics uh, and it looking like we've pre-picked somebody uh, and, that, and we shouldn't we shouldn't do that we, we should be, it should be a basic program where people would have to apply and go through a process yeah but I, I I agree with that look I'm not I'm not overly against the idea of this what I'm suggesting is that I think we have other partners <coughs> that do this I don't know if we've ever done it have we uh, we have never used CDBG dollars for those purposes. So, and, C and, and are we not liable if we misuse CDGB grant? I mean, we are held liable in that circumstance. Uh, all I want to know is just, is there, to achieve the same effect, if another organization does it, then why do we have to do it? Why does the city have to insert itself? Uh, if I could... Sure, so, go ahead. So, I'm just asking I mean, a question. No, and I, I understand your question. I... It sh should be answered, bottom line. But I think there's another way to look at this. We've already invested a lot of money doing this on our own. We now have federal funds that are coming into the city that we can use to actually leverage. Um, with the other 35 homes, structures, trailers that we use, that was city money. We're using those same principles to do the same efforts, but we now have money that's federal not funds. we now have federal funds but I, I don't think I, I agree that we're dealing with the same subject matter I don't think that the mechanism in which the transaction took place is anything at all alike I it's not but I, I understand like I'm just throwing caution out there a little bit if we can make it happen great I just want to reduce risk along the way we've never done it before right has habitat done it before Habitat builds new homes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they fund the demo 
for others to undertake the development. No. Um, Matt, when we did the homes repair program, this would be very much the same process. People came to us. Jennifer, you might probably know this better, but they came to us with what they needed repairs on their homes, you know, critical repairs, right? And we looked at the need of each of those and made the determination, and then the city did go in and do the work. So it was an application process asking for it. We weren't picking who we thought needed it. They came to us. This is I'm hearing that is the same <clears throat> thing we're doing here. But, but when we do the application process, we ultimately have to pick somebody, right? Well, yes, based on need. But we are picking somebody. Well, we have to based on need. So who's doing the picking? Who in the city staff is picking who gets the house? I don't well, we, we would, the scope of the program would be limited to demolition, not building a new house. I, I mean, thought, it would be predicated upon. But I mean, we're not going to demo something without knowing that they're going to get something in return, right? I mean, we'd have to right. have, we'd have, to have an agree, we'd have to have an agreement with whoever agree the landowner is that yes. because we're putting the money in for demolition that right. within a certain amount of time, they're going to have to put in a new structure. Right. And there will be a lien attached to the property for the full cost that was expended on the demo with the agreement, once the agreement is fulfilled, then that lien would be released. So, right. well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a suggestion here, Matt. I think it's a great idea. And that's all I think is I think it, I think the idea is we need to develop rather than sitting here talking for three or four hours and trying to figure out what the parameters of the program should be from the council. I would really appreciate if we would not do the fifteen thousand this year. Okay. If we would kind of develop a a program along these lines in a little more detail and take time to brief that to the council, perhaps for, for next year's allocation. Does anybody, this Could, question along those lines? Well, I just have a comment, Mayor. We, we're, Thursday night, we're going to be opening up a 15 public day um, process, right? Hearing process. So if Matt and his team could, because I'm very much in favor, I understand exactly what he's wanting to do and what they're wanting to do with this money. Um, if he could come up with a plan proposal during that 15, before we vote on this for real, would that be okay? If well, he could figure out how to make it understood to our council members before the final period, because as we said, we don't know if we're getting CDBG funds next year. Well, here's, here's the thing. Uh, the item number three, we're talk, what we're talking about is identifying specific projects that we would present. Uh -huh for the 15th. So we need to have a consensus today on whether or not we add the new proposal or not add the new proposal. And then that become that would okay. be then part of the item that would go before the public for 15 days. Okay, in that case I am in favor of adding it to the proposal. <laughs> Mr. Petucci. Yes, Mayor Mueller, uh, members of the council, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, probably what's kind of confuse the issue a little bit is we were approached by specific people. Uh, that meeting that took place with uh, Mr. McLaughlin sparked an idea, not specific necessarily to those folks that met with him, but the idea is to develop a program that takes care specifically of demolition, not pick and choose who's going to build a new house or anything like that. So. Of course, then all folks in the community that are in that situation would be eligible. What we need to do is develop a process by which there's an application and a, a way they? to go about, you know, deciding where the funds go. Who was it's it? It's really who? a relatively simple process. Who was it who approached? We should have the folks that own the property. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the folks who the folks who own the property approached us well, to get CDGB grants to do demolition projects on their property. Well, prior to that, though, following the last council work session on this subject, where there was a question on the potential demand, yeah. I reached out to Clayton Homes, who's a prominent manufactured home builder, to find out how many units they're constructing in Sierra Vista and whether uh, a fund like like this would increase the likelihood or the feasibility of property owners to replace their older dilapidated homes with newer, uh, new manufactured homes, and they thought it would uh, help in that regard. So um, 
just globally, uh, you know, we think there there would be demand uh, and interest in in this program. Yeah. And then subsequent to that, we had the meeting on that specific parcel. I, I think you said something earlier, too, that indicated this is not an uncommon practice for city, for municipalities to do this mm -hmm. as part of CDBG or other funds that they have available to them. And the, the in purpose is the affordable housing piece, which I understand we need in our community. I have a question about what affordable uh, and if this is not the appropriate time, we can talk about it later. If you describe uh, what the affordable housing means and what um, what method do we have to be sure that uh, those who benefit from whatever we might do would would keep their homes affordable, if they're renting yeah. or or leasing or selling. And I concur that there's a deficit of quality affordable housing. There's exactly. a distinction there. Okay. Uh, and the the HUD definition is um, set in accordance to 30% of uh, area median income being spent on housing. And there's a table that scales to family size. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, that, yeah. okay, we can we can get that information. Yeah. I okay. I I agree with the mayor given the information that's now been put out that if a private entity approached the city to receive CDGB grants uh, to then turn around and, and even if the optics are there may be a benefit there for the demolition to occur. I agree actually with Ms. Calhoun. I'm concerned that uh, what would be going in in its place, would that actually be considered uh, you know, affordable housing, or would it be some other mechanism to uh, put something else in there? I would like to see a fuller plan uh, from cradle to grave of what this thing looks like. Maybe I'm confused, uh, but I do think that given the situation and the limited of these funds, and I, I just want to use some, some due diligence on this particular issue. I, I don't have an issue with any of the other things that are on the table. I agree. <clears throat> I have drafted a demolition program outline, uh, and that was included in the last uh, presentation. Uh, I don't see it in this package here. Um, that could be provided to council if there's interest in adding it. Again, it's an alternate recommendation we're proposing for consideration. Uh, we have the recommendations in the memo, but we wanted to float that idea as a potential alternative. And um, okay, so what I we're looking for- I guess that what I need to ask council this afternoon is the alternate recommendation. Do you want that included or not included in the uh, recommendation that we have our 15 day uh, period commitment or our comment period? I would like it included. So we got one that would it's like it included. Page. Oh, it's back with all the attachments. You, no. no. It's, it will be I haven't heard from you guys. I, I support the inclusion. I think we have an opportunity here. Um, it's, in, it's in this package. I'm trying to choose my words carefully, respectfully. I, I don't see this as nuanced and um, revolutionary as I think we're making it out to be. And drawing a comparison to the West End <laughs> Sierra Vista Partnership Program, um, we, we open up the process to people who are interested we leverage funds that are coming from the federal government. We're not tapping into our own general fund. I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, the West End Sierra Vista Partnership Program is a similar application process. It's open to the public, and then the council has to choose eventually um, to meet the needs of the city. So I support the inclusion. Any comments, Bob? I support. Okay. So what I'm what I'm hearing is a consensus that we go with the with the uh, amended recommendation for the comment period. Any any further discussion on that? Um, we're talking item number three specifically. Item number four is is obviously related, and this is for a 15 day public hearing, to just just to establish the window. And I will tell you that uh, we do need to have the details of the, the $15,000 program for this house basically more in more than just an outline format. 
because there will be questions and it will have to be a competitive uh, uh, process so that everybody who is interested has the opportunity. So uh, that, that needs to be open as much as possible. Okay, are we ready to move on to item number five, which is the minutes of 22 June? And does anybody have any, any additions, deletions, completions, changes? I do. Maria, if you look at uh, the last par the next to last paragraph where it says May starts Mayor Mueller stated, we go down to the one, two, three, four, fifth line from the bottom, second to last word. Uh, it says uh, to accept a the reward as as he concluded the discussion. It should be a ward, not reward. Okay. We didn't get any money from the ADC. We just got a banner. Okay. All righty. Anything else on the, the minutes? So we do read them once in a while. <laughs> we do. Okay. Uh, next item is the to get the moratorium on the collection of development fees. Uh, Mrs. Jacobs, item number six, please. Certainly, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, during the budget discussion, the city manager explain to you that he was including in the calculations a recommendation to uh, suspend the collection of development fees for a period of two years. This action before you that you'll take uh, a vote on on Thursday is the culmination and is what is required in order to officially suspend the fees. Um, just as a reminder, the fee for a new home is a total of $3,226, and just as an example, if there were a 5,000 square foot retail operation that would come to Sierra Vista, this would save them $20,000. The reason why this is before you is uh, twofold. Number one, um, the suspension will be used, utilized and marketed as a um, an economic development incentive in order to hopefully attract um, and incentivize some additional investment in new structures in the community. Secondly, it does um, allow the city to avoid the transfer, the annual transfer of general fund revenues into the um, development fee fund, which is estimated to be about $100,000, which was already removed from the um, budget that you passed on a tentative basis. And that portion is the 25% of the portion um, of the development fees in police, fire, and uh, transportation that the council has included since the inception of the development fee program in 2007, that portion which is paid for out of uh, sales taxes, construction sales tax specifically. So, uh, and then the second reason is that it would avoid the administration fees. Um, it's an estimated $13,000 for an additional audit, which is required by state law that we would be able to avoid, and again has been deducted from next year's budget, as well as um, reporting requirements that the city staff <coughs> does, which is not a um, financial, um, but it is a, a workload operation. You'll notice that this resolution does have an emergency clause in it. We use emergency clauses uh, very judiciously, and the reason why is because um, ordinarily a resolution requires a 30-day um, implementation period before it can go into effect. Well, we already know that the moment that you approve it, no one is going to be applying for building permit during those 30 days, but they will end up waiting until that period is up in order to save the funds. So uh, we don't want to hold any project up that may already be on schedule. Therefore, um, the emergency clause is being recommended for inclusion in this item. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mrs. Jacobs. Any questions for Mrs. Jacobs? Just one bit of clarification to, to anyone who may be listening. This only is for new construction. This is not about redoing older buildings. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Calhoun, yes. If there is um, new square footage added to any building, then they are required to pay that their pro rata share um, ordinarily without the moratorium of development fees. But 
if there was either a demolition or there is or there's simply uh, improvements being made to a structure it's about the square footage so just as an example the project the um, the former restaurant that was demolished in from a, in front of Target as long as their total new footprint does not exceed the previous footprint there would be no development fees that would be imposed on that project so yes you're correct okay Thank you. any other questions no okay that can that concludes the, uh, the <coughs> next uh, council meeting. We now move on to item number C, which is a review of cap review of capital financing options. I missed the cherry video. Yeah, you did. Oh, how sad. It's, it's okay. still on there. I mean, you can still watch it's, it. It's available on there. <laughs> we can rewatch it. <laughs> it was really good. He was crushed. You weren't here. <laughs> so I'm really <laughs> upset. <laughs> Well, my employees need to behave so I can get here on time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mayor Mueller, members of the council. Uh, as uh, we went through the uh, bu Where's budget process leading up to the approval of the tentative budget, uh, we mentioned the potential of significant savings and debt service as a result of restructuring the uh, three bonds that we currently have outstanding. Been working with Mr. Tom Hocking, who has been the city's financial consultant dealing with uh, bond issues for uh, as long as I can remember since I've been here. So he's uh, very, very experienced. His job is to take a look at the financial markets, the structure of our bonds, call dates, those kind of things and then let us know if an opportunity comes for savings with the results uh, resulting in a restructuring of the bonds and taking advantage of lower interest rates. So that's what we're talking about here today. Mr. Hocking will be here next week uh, on Monday to go over the specifics of all this. I'm just trying to give you an update in terms of where we're at and, and what's going on. And we have a little bit more information to share with you today. So uh, just to go over some of the benefits of the refinancing, uh, the tax exempt bond market conditions are very favorable right now and with uh, very low interest rates. Uh, we will see a reduction of the city's overall debt service costs going forward as a result of doing refinancing. We're estimating savings right now at approximately $700,000 over the remaining uh, term and maturities of the bonds. So it's a very, very significant thing that we're trying to undertake and can certainly help us uh, at a time when we need the help. Uh, interest rates on the new bonds may be less than 2%. Chuck, uh, if you, Chuck, if you, yes, sir. Chuck, um, sorry to interrupt your flow. You ahead. had it really going there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> On the current bonds, can you give me the rates of those two for comparison? As a matter of fact, I they're brought my, my... They're on the next slide. Uh, Yay. And they're also in your handy CAFR that Dave puts oh, okay. together that I he's getting... I don't have a, those slides <laughs> for some reason. So. Oh. Okay, well, we'll answer, we'll answer that question. Anyway, uh, the rates will be potentially 2% or less uh, for the remaining uh, term of maturities. We will not be looking to extend uh, the current maturities uh, of the bonds. We actually uh, will be able to uh, shorten the final maturity of our series 2008 bonds from 2023 to 2022, also a good thing. And the ability to change uh, bond covenants to be more flexible or favorable to the city, and that means things like call provisions usually will be able to even refinance uh, at, more expeditiously uh, in the future if the rates uh, turn out to be even more favorable than they are now. But the terms we're talking about are relatively short, so I don't envision that happening. But it's nice to have the option of changing uh, if we have the ability to do that. So uh, these are the bonds that uh, we're looking at refunding. The 2008 bonds I just talked about. The remaining principal balance is approximately $8.4 million on those with a fi final maturity of January 1st, 2023. So really not that far out uh, if you look at the grand scheme of, of bonding, but uh, still out uh, another uh, five and a half years. The original interest rate is approximately 4.7% uh, on those, which was a very good rate at that point in time. Uh, bonds, the way they typically are structured, uh, you have a, a series uh, running, say, 20 years. Uh, the first uh, number of years being short-term loans at relatively lower interest rates. And as you go out longer on the yield curve on the bonds, 
the last five years are typically, uh, and these I think are included in the 5% range, so we're actually talking about an average there of 4.7, but we're really talking about refinancing the uh, higher rate of the bonds right now. So, uh, and of course, uh, to secure those bonds, we use our excise taxes, which is our sales taxes, uh, primarily from the Capital Improvements Fund. We also have another series, uh, the 2010 uh, Municipal Property Corporation bonds. Those have already been refinanced once. Uh, we have about $4.3 million uh, left on those with a final maturity of January 1st, 2021. So even a shorter period of time, interest rates on those were lower at the time with the average over the term of the bonds around 4%. And again, uh, secured uh, by the same sources of revenue. Chuck, when yep. we um, refinance the bonds, is there, I'm sure there is a cost in the actual refinancing, much as if we were going to refinance a house? That's correct. Mm. And is are these numbers including that refinance to pay that? They do, and there's another closing? slide that'll okay. talk, uh, talk a little bit about that. But yes, uh, the, all those costs are included in the savings. Mm. Good question, though. Okay, then uh, our, the one that we have uh, out there for the longest period of time is our 2012 uh, water and sewer obligation uh, bonds, which uh, were uh, floated to pay for the improvements at the Environmental Operations Park, uh, adding the clarifier project, uh, which was uh, fairly expensive. Uh, those uh, mature on January 1st of 2027. Uh, we had a very good interest rate at that time of about 2.7% on average over term, and those are secured by your sewer uh, rate payers and, and the rates that are paid through the sewer fund. So uh, three major ones uh, that are out there. We are going to refinance at 2.7? What uh, Mr. Hawking is proposing at the current time is a refinance of all the callable bonds from each of the three bond issues. Uh, callable meaning that uh, maturities, uh, typically what happens is uh, you're locked in, say on a 20 year uh, note, you're locked in for 10 years at certain <coughs> interest rates and you have to wait that 10 years before you can refinance the bonds without any additional penalties. Uh, so it's a very typical provision uh, in many bonds. So. Uh, you know, a lot or most of these are callable. Some of them uh, are not, but we're, we're talking about uh, it refinancing the callable portion of the bonds, which will reduce some of the costs associated with that. Chuck. Yes. So you said that the um, refinance is going to be somewhere around 2%, right? That's what we're thinking, thinking right Thinking a little lower, or it might be a little higher. Well, by next week, as we move closer to the date the council has to make a decision, we'll be able to really hone to lock in, it in on those rates. And so, do we get to lock it for 30 days? Um, we'll actually bring a proposal to you that's locked uh, <laughs> when that occurs. So. Okay. So then my question is, if, can you go back to the bond that's currently at 2.7? Mm -hmm. My question is, if... We lock in a rate that's around 2.2, 2.5. Then is it, it going to be worth, worth it, it to, to refinance that 2.7% loan? Well, actually, that's a very good question. And that's why, you know, we want to be very careful when we, you know, before we come to you with a firm recommendation. We're okay. not there yet. Uh, one of the slides gets to we're actually looking for proposals right now. Okay. When we get those, we'll have better numbers to share okay. with you, hopefully by next week. Okay. And then, you know, we'll know, is it worthwhile to do this or not? Okay. And if it isn't, then obviously we don't want to recommend to the council that you right. do that portion. And then, but, and you're going to look at, I mean, obviously it, it, it doesn't have to be all of or none, right? We can just leave the lower interest rate one out. Absolutely. And refinance the other two. Yeah, those are the okay. options uh, okay. that you have available. To All right. You. Yeah, that just I needed that cleared up. Thank you. So right now, uh, what Mr. Hawking is proposing is what's called a private placement of the bonds, meaning that specific uh, lending institutions, banks, et cetera, would actually bid on our business to do the refinancing. Uh, typically, when you issue the bonds, that is an option uh, for 
placing the bonds, but uh, these uh, went out to public sale. So then when it went out to public sale, then institutions you know, had the right to go ahead and, and bid on those. Here we would be looking at an individual institution bidding on our uh, remaining bonds and then uh, hopefully bringing us the best interest rates uh, available for those. So that's what we're looking at. And the reason to do that is uh, getting back to Ms. Wolf's question, it saves a significant amount of bond sale costs. When you go out to a public sale, you know, you have to put together prospectuses and, and all those kind of things, a lot of legal documents. Uh, not that there won't be any here, there will be, but it, it is much simpler to do a private placement at less cost. So that gets to your question. It also reduces the amount of time to issue the bonds, which means we can lock in those rates, get it going quickly, also saving some money as well. So, so that's what he's proposing right now. And we're, we, I'm sorry, and we don't think there's going to be any problem placing them privately? No, no, I, I almost guarantee there'll be business. In fact, I got an email today from one who was uh, looking to bid, so I'm reasonably sure we'll have competition for that. So the initial proposals from these financial institutions uh, are to be received by Mr. Hawking uh, by July 13th, and then he will bring those to the council on the 17th at your next work session. So you have an idea of, of who's there, what the bids are, all those kind of things, you know, what the terms of the deal will be. And then we'll be looking to place uh, the selected option uh, by the council in front of you for uh, authorization on July 27th, which will be your next regularly scheduled uh, council meeting. And then he hopes to be able to close the transaction after approval by the council on August 10th and then we can start seeing the savings as a result of the refinancing at that point. Yes, Gwen. Do you have a general sense of, of an annual amount of savings uh, over the life of the rest of the bonds, uh, the, these bonds, especially the first two? Well, uh, again, all together, he's looking at a savings right now of 700000 So. Uh, depending on the structure uh, of the bids uh, as they come in and the rates, uh, that is going to be one of the things he'll have to give you when he gets these proposals in. So that'll be, I can't really a answer that question exactly right now, but he'll lay out, you know, what the annual savings are and that kind of thing. I think the biggest thing here really is the shortening of that term by one year, even though it's only a year. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. That's a half million dollars, uh, you know, savings uh, in that one year for that particular budget year, which isn't that far out anymore. So, so that's a really good thing. <laughs> But he, he will give you the layout of what those payments will look like in the savings. And any other questions? Try to keep it short. But and when did you say he was going to be here? Monday. This upcoming Monday? Yes. Do we have a meeting scheduled? Yes, yes we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's on my calendar. I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Greg. I, I, I won't be here potentially on Monday. Mm -hmm. It's uh, my birthday week. So I'm going to continue on that celebration, but I love this kind of. <laughs> yeah. a little hero sing happy I'm turning, I'm turning to 40, so I mean I got to go party it up while I can. I think you better celebrate I, for a month. I, but but if I'm not here, I I love the idea of doing this. I know we had a chance to speak a little bit this week, and and I I, I do see the long-term strategic potential to have that kind of moved off and potentially open up uh, another one in the near future. But it looks like we've got about a month before we see where the final. Mm -hmm. piece all lays out but uh, I'll, I'll get with you or your staff and, and get the okay the information we'll, we'll get you we'll get all the information from mr. thank Hawking you Chuck good we'll presentation see. okay yeah, any other questions okay try to keep it short thank all right you. thank you thank you mr. Petitia good work uh, we next move to item D which is uh, discussion for a budget proposal by mr. Mount thank you mayor um, so I had kind of uh, at least floated the, the idea out, and uh, I know the mayor wasn't here and Mr. Patuchek wasn't here. Um, I did have an opportunity to sit down with, with both of them and um, kind of go through some of this, and I got some good advice. So I, I kind of wrote this up. I, I did not want to send out uh, like a lengthy slideshow. I didn't think that that was really required. This isn't overly complicated, um, but it does require 
uh, and Mayor, if I'm using the wrong terminology based on the plan from 2008, just correct me. But essentially, it's the council's fiscal policy as it pertains to budget surplus savings. So it's been about 10 years since the council uh, has changed, uh, since 2008 has changed its policy on surplus savings that, that kind of pop up through the budget process. Um, so what that means is that the council has a formal standing guidance to the city management on what to do with any, I'm going to use the term salary savings uh, from the budget uh, for, uh, for budgeted but unfilled positions. Uh, salary savings is just my term. The basic definition is we have a position that has been allocated. The position isn't filled. Uh, every two weeks, payroll hits, uh, but that money isn't used for, there's nobody to pay. Uh, and then there's also some savings on the benefits. Typically, that money has been pre-programmed to go to a certain spot. This idea, I don't say this idea, this solution would help give the council some flexibility, and also I believe it helped give staff some flexibility as well. Uh, the council used to have a budget review every six months. You had the, um, the formal budget process and the passing of the budget, and then six months later there would be a, I guess, a semi-annual budget review by council, uh, in which case they could take a look at any potential projected budget surplus or new monies that had come in. Um, what this would allow the, the council to do is, with the staff is to figure out where some of that surplus could go. And I'll, I'll kind of read through this. So the basis of all this is based on the real, you know, the reality that all organizations experience turnover. That's expected. It also takes time to fill authorized positions. Uh, no matter what we approve, we won't automatically hire a position. That takes time. We know that we're, we're looking to fill police officer positions. I know there's a number of them that are out there. They're still out there. They're still funded. We still want them but we're not gonna hire them the moment the budget gets passed. So what do we do with that money as it kind of comes through? Every two weeks, um, the authorized but unfilled positions remain vacant, produces a salary surplus against the personnel budget estimate. This includes the salary and the benefit costs. Now, when I started working with this and was with the help of getting some of the data from staff, and thank you, Mr. Patuchek, for your time, uh, uh, there was approximately 20 authorized positions that were not filled, and that number fluctuates, it changes. Some of them get filled, other people turn over, and there's a constant organizational flow for those personnel costs. Uh, the numbers that I used were based at the time on the 20 allocated but unfilled positions. Uh, and I had to wait a little bit because I wanted to wait for the class comp uh, numbers to come in so I could calculate it out. Uh, but those numbers came out to be approximately uh, $805,000 in annual salaries, more if you add in the benefits, uh, if the assistant city manager position, which I know has already been put out there, if that were, uh, once Ms. Jacobs uh, leaves to go up to Oro Valley, that position were to remain vacant, that would be approximately $915,000 in annual savings. Uh, but I'm not looking to say those positions go away. I, I just used an arbitrary, time, an arbitrary time period, six months, against the range of those positions and those salaries. And it came out to be, I used six months, and it was three hundred dollars to 450000 and this is real money, but it's unearned, uh, but it should be expected to occur. So we have a couple different courses. Originally, I had proposed a temporary suspension on those positions, not all of them. Uh, and of course, that was kind of contingent on what council and staff could handle or what they could I put stomach, and that would yield a corresponding savings. But I do think that that may not be necessary. What would be necessary would be a change to the policy that at the six-month mark, that as the natural ebb and flow of turnover and hiring uh, lag, that council would need to kind of pick up at six months from now, take a look at what that money looks like that it hasn't been used, and then go back in and have some sort of discussion where we get staff's input. And I wrote down a few ideas. So where do the reserves go? It could go to departmental requirements. You know, what do departments have that have popped up? Uh, it could go to capital improvements, O and M. It could go to PSR, uh, PSRSP. Um, it could go to any number of different things. That acronym, the Public Safety Retirement uh, <laughs> Pension System. That's <laughs> um, we had also, and this was something that was pointed out with my discussion with with staff as well, was we'd also have a better idea of some of the early projections for state shared revenue, uh, the retirement costs, tax revenues, uh, things along those lines. So my recommendation is that we change our policy as it relates to this budget so that six months from now, uh, well, first off, that any salary surplus just kind of gets held. 
And then six months from now, we go back and we have a formal session or two, hear from staff on what opportunities are out there, find out exactly how much has been saved, and then give some feedback to what we want to go into reserves, what do we want to use for capital, what do we want to use to potentially pay down the, uh, the pension liability, et cetera. So, Mayor, that, that's essentially what I'm asking for in this budget is, a, is, is an addition to how we conduct the budget. Okay. And uh, just, just for the record, I'll mention that uh, Resolution 2008-135 uh, is the document that Craig referred to. Thank you. And it's the city financial policy. And most of the information that's in the financial policy is repeated uh, in the budget books as well. So it's the same. It's basically the same information. Uh, I, I agree with you, Craig. I think a six-month review is great. Uh, I will tell you that my experience with the Army, we always used to have a list of unfunded requirements. Sir. Sure. And uh, sometimes they got funded through other other me for, for through <coughs> savings, and that's what we're talking about: essential savings. But I also tell you that uh, one of the things that concerns me a lot of times when we have a savings at the end of the year, no matter where it comes from in the budget, is up to now we put that in a strategic reserve. And the reason we put it in the strategic reserve is basically when we have we have events like the, uh, the fire, the first 24 hours basically is, is covered by the, the municipality. And if, and, and if it's declared a natural disaster, then most of the things after that first 24 hours can be, uh, you can't ask the, the federal government uh, for reimbursement. However, they don't reimburse everything as we found out during the fire. So we didn't need to have a, a reasonable uh, cash on cash on hand. And when I first uh, heard about your your uh, your uh, recommendation, I thought I thought the six months was good. I didn't really think it, it's wise to go into the detail of actually picking positions and saying these need to be held, et cetera, and I'm glad to see that you, you've, you've changed your position on that as well. But we do need to review at six months, I think, uh, where we stand. We do need to give guidance to the city manager on uh, where that uh, unspent money goes. Uh, at, and I think the six-month mark is a good time to do that. <coughs> And I would, I would uh, just recommend my, to my council members for consideration, as we know, we need, we know that the ASRS, the Arizona Retirement System, as well as the PSPRS, uh, is going to go up as it has in a number of years. And per perhaps one of the things we need to consider is taking a portion of that saved money and applying it, applying it to both those, both those things on a regular basis. But again, uh, that's that's something I think when we have a we have an idea of what that number is going to look like at, at mid year, uh, that's really when we need to have that discussion. Anybody else? Me. So yeah, I mean, I love the idea of reviewing the financial policies, but I would like to add that we a requirement also that we can get a five to ten year forecast so that we can look ahead and um, that would be valuable because we know that the PSPR, P, PSPRS, I can't get that straight. I, I don't think it's going down anywhere in the near future. So that liability is going to be and we need a projection and that will, I think that helps us make good decisions now based on what we're forecasting to happen in the next five to 10 years as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, First of all, I want to thank um, Craig for looking into ways of saving funds for the community. What I want to clarify, uh, saving, uh, at any rate, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. I, I appreciate that you've looked at the budget and looking for ways that we uh, can find money in the system. Uh, I do want to understand, though, that you're not talking about not hiring. No, that's what okay. I'm saying. There's no, and that there's was no great, savings. So let yeah, me, let I understand. No, no, that. I really do get it. And thank you for clarifying it and, and making it clear to, to everybody who's listening. Um, because your first uh, suggestion that I, the way I understood it was not hiring for six months. And, and of course, I didn't see the value in that. But in this, that's what not, looks like a revision. That's not, no, that was never, it's, it's the same principle. It just comes up with a different mechanism. So okay. that no matter what's going to happen is there's going to be turnover and there's going to be lag. If we could hire all those, and I'm going to keep using the police officers as an example because that's the example that I keep hearing about. I, I get it. I do get it. I understand. 
And and I think it's a, a very good um, way that if if we are reviewing the plan every six months, reviewing the money that's has is unspent, and I believe you called it a salary surplus, or a salary is that right? Salary surplus. Sure. Uh, would it just idea. be salaries just in general, or would it benefits. would it be reserve in general? Say we bid on a project and well, it didn't cost actually, us as much as actually we thought. Actually, what we're asking Chuck to do, I think, is we're saying, okay, we're halfway through the year. You tell us how much how much you think is going to be unspent, and it's, it's his best guess it, by the end of the year that aren't going to, isn't going to be used for other things. And then at that point in time, we have to decide. Is it going to go into the reserve like we've always done it? Or, or are we going to put it towards gonna, something else? Are we going to put it towards something else, PSPRS, ARS? Or is there a project, and I'll just throw, throw out upgrading of, of uh, IT or those mm -hmm. kind of things. But mm -hmm. again, that's mid-year guidance. That we, that's the kind of guidance we need to give, give okay. Chuck. And that's fine. I just want to make sure manager. it wasn't just salaries, that that was in every area across the city. Well, the, we're going to have savings. I'm open to all forms well, of efficiencies. And, and, that's, and that's what we need to look for is all efficiencies. The, the, biggest, okay. the biggest target, obviously, that we know we're going to have some is going to be salary. We can't guarantee that we're going to have some in all the other categories. Okay. Chuck? Uh, yeah, I Mr. Mayor, members questions. of the council, I, I think, you know, a few things are important to, to consider. And, uh, you know, Mr. Kraps is in the audience. Uh, he was on the council when we used to do uh, mid-year budget reviews uh, on an annual basis. So uh, we kind of got away from that when things got tight and there wasn't really any money to really talk about. But, uh, but uh, that's not formally in the financial policy right now to, to do that. So that might be a change that, that you might be interested in. It also doesn't mention public safety retirement or Arizona state retirement in the financial policy either. So that, those might be things we need to look at. But uh, and some principles that are important to note is that uh, we don't have any contingency funds in the budget, uh, so uh, we always have used the policy of uh, budgeting 100% of personnel costs, and that has provided uh, a cushion for us in the event that revenues either don't come in uh, the way we would expect or unforeseen emergency expenses come up uh, to cover them. So that's why they're there. We, you know, a lot of cities will have a contingency line item or whatever in the mm -hmm. budget. We don't have that there. So, so there, there is that uh, that we need to consider. Uh, generally, you know, we will generate uh, or we won't spend as much in the personnel area. At year end, uh, Mr. Felix uh, gets together with me to go over what the estimates are, and we look at you know adding that to reserves per your financial policy, or we also take a look at reducing potential future debt, uh, which is also mentioned in your mm -hmm. policies. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at the start of the year, we may have thought, well, we need to. Uh, finance this capital equipment purchase, but because we have some available cash, we'll opt to cash it out as opposed to taking on more debt. So those are kind of the two areas that we look at uh, with those funds. What what uh, Mr. Bond is proposing would give you uh, an idea, uh, probably in the February time frame, once we get all the January numbers put together, uh, of looking at where are our revenues at at this time uh, projected out to the end of the year? Where are our expenses? Uh, and that will not only include uh, personnel expenses, but you know projects that we've mm -hmm. undertaken. Uh, maybe they came in under bid. You know, maybe they came in over you know budget. So you know we'll be able to share that information with you and come up with some numbers by fund, and then potentially make some recommendations to you about. Uh, any projects, O and M, or things we see as potential emergencies that maybe could be done in the current fiscal year, as opposed to carrying them forward and presenting them to you next fiscal year. So and that that would be the idea. And I'm just going to reiterate: I think that our decision would be made a lot easier if we had some projections going forward oh, and, five oh, to I ten years. I want to address that too, Mr. Hawking. We've also asked to do a five-year projection oh, great. for us. Oh, so, you're uh, ahead of me. Thank you, Chuck. We already talked about all that. So that. You know, we're uh, going to engage him to uh, to do that as well. And Thank you. I, I haven't seen the proposal yet. But so we don't know how long it'll be before we have that. Hopefully by Monday. Uh, oh, we'll, cool. We'll tell us what the proposal is. The exciting then, reading. I can't wait. No, no, not the forecast. Uh, oh, not the forecast. No, 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 no. 
He's putting a proposal together <laughs> to do one for us. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I don't want to read the proposal. Now, I want to read the forecast. Monday, no. <laughs> Probably in the fall. Probably in the fall, mm -hmm. before the six-month period is up. Yeah, and he, okay. and he can take a look at our overall budget and financial situation, mm -hmm. the trends with regards to retirement. And will he evaluate the state of the PSPRS system? Okay, thank uh, you. That, I'll tell you. That'll be challenging if yeah. he does that. Yeah, okay. it's going to be Excuse challenging. Me. Going out 10 years is, is a little problematic. Though. But you're going to do five. Yeah, five the crystal okay. ball gets uh, murkier. Yeah. yeah, no, make it more clear. So I'm good with five. Thank you. What? I appreciate that. Thank you. And I did hear um, Chuck mention that not only in salary um, surplus, no, not surplus, savings, neither one of those words seem quite right. I don't like to use the word surplus. Yeah. Fund, fund balance is <laughs> fund what we're talking about. Okay, I have to yes. get comfortable with that. Um, uh, in addition to the fund balance of that's present at the six-month period, uh, just kind of give me the right words if I'm missing them. Uh, there's other ways that um, funds are saved in a, in a municipality. And uh, I, I think over the years, Chuck, you've kind of talked about different efficiencies that the city has taken on that have saved money. And I, I would, um, I think, encourage a continued look at efficiencies, uh, programs that are um, not giving us um, the benefit that we expect. And I don't think this is anything new. I'm just kind of going over in my own head. Um, it things that uh, staff maybe um, would recommend as savings that we haven't looked at yet. Uh, I, I can't help but mention that uh, uh, something everybody's familiar with, and that's the um, Texas, my home state, uh, effort that was made several years back that ended up saving so much statewide dollars over some of the smallest things. And I have to mention that um, across the state, in government-owned buildings, there were soda machines, and somebody recommended taking the lights out of those machines, and the savings uh, across the state was in the millions. Um, I, I just thought that was fascinating, and uh, they went on to make uh, other great savings across the state. I know this is stuff you're familiar with, but um, even to the point that other states started using their techniques for finding those ways of efficiencies. And I hope that uh, we, especially as times have been so difficult, uh, have exploited all of those possibilities. And generally, utilities are the greatest area where um, savings, and I can't help but think about electricity. Uh, SSVC is not in the room, are they? <laughs> Uh, that was a joke, please, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you know what I'm talking about, those kinds of savings that uh, a lot of the things that are never measured, uh, we never think about. And I think there's, there may be in our system some continued things that we could um, uh, cut, cut cost in. Some of those things we don't normally think about because we seem to always talk about programs but I'm talking about littler than those programs, smaller issues. So um, I, I think we may be able to accommodate some more increased savings just by asking employees what areas do they see we can make some uh, increased savings in. And even as our funding increases, which it no doubt will, uh, we still want to be a tight, efficient organization. Uh, and, and I, I say that with recognition, Chuck, Mary, and the rest of the staff, that efforts are always being made, and I think they need to continue to cut costs wherever possible. Um, let me see. I, I think that's all for right now that I have to say about that. And Mr. Mayor, just uh, quickly, uh, to your point, uh, Ms. Calhoun, uh, you know, we have you know operated at about 20% uh, less of employee uh, levels uh, for you know since 2008 2009 mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons you know while workload really has not decreased uh, over that period of time and 
the, one of the main reasons we've been able to do that is by taking advantage of automation, uh, you know, and computer applications and, and those kind of things to, to the point where I don't think necessarily we're going to need to rehire that 20%, you know, unless there's some ex explosive growth, you know, uh, that occurs. Uh, we, we will constantly be able to take advantage of the savings and, and the and the automation that we've put in. And probably the one of the more frustrating things over the past few years is I always like to have some sort of automation initiative in the budget uh, to uh, carry on that uh, you know, tradition. But uh, the past few years has been very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we talk about um, staff, um, I'm always uh, concerned about morale. Uh, and whenever you mention the 20% drop, um, mor uh, morale and workload, and um, I have no way of measuring that, uh, what the morale of the staff is, and I don't generally go out and ask, but um, simply because I, I, I don't know what to, <laughs> anyway, I don't ask, um, but I think it's really, really important, and the minute we start looking at um, efficiencies, um, I, I think, oh, I kind of lost my train there. Um, look at efficiencies, I think morale gets into the picture and customer service and the, um, the kind of service we provide. And I'm wondering, Chuck, how do we measure uh, in, at this point how satisfied our customers are, how, how much services we're still able. I know we've been over this, but when we start talking about... Um, Dollars. That that's always my first thought. Yeah. Well, obviously we've used survey instruments uh, in the past. Uh, you know, with with mixed results. Uh, you know, typically uh, I look at morale and motivation. You can see that in turnover rate numbers, uh, leave uh, usage numbers, uh, those kind of things. So uh, I do pay pay attention to uh, to those types of things in order to kind of get an idea of. Uh, of where we think the employees are. So. Okay, we're getting a little far afield from the from the uh, posted proposal. item, Mr. Mr. Yeah, uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I I just want to um, <clears throat> yeah because that we kind of expanded out a little bit from yeah. the the scope. Um, although I, I will say that if if council does want to include more efficiencies or projections, I'm obviously in favor of both those types of things. But for right now, mm -hmm. the only thing that I'm respectfully asking the council to consider uh, is that six month, uh, just to reestablish in our fiscal policy that six month mark. And then we know, you know, Chuck already does it anyways, but there's gonna be an ebb and flow of the fund balances pertaining to the positions that are allocated, uh, that are budgeted, but not filled. And then for council to have that discussion in six months. And I have uh, no um, requests of council at this time to say that 30 percent's got to go here or 20 percent's got to go there i just want to have the option to have the discussion uh, i think if we do that uh, i think that gives us more uh, control and i don't mean that in terms of uh, you know leadership control but in terms of policy mm -hmm. gives us a better idea of what we can do with it uh, and so i'll kind of cap my ask at that and mayor i believe yeah, the next I, step would be i'm going to give some some guidance and then you guys shout out at me if i'm going off the tracks here but basically chuck it looks like we're going to have a mid we're going to have a mid-year review the the uh, uh of the budget uh, and obviously the focus is going to be on uh our not only the status of the budget but where else where else uh, we have opportunities to improve the budget uh we need to look we need to review the financial policy on that right quick so what we're saying is um, what surplus or fund balance we have, let's put it that way, in the mid-year, you're going to bring us alternatives to choose where that money should go, right? <laughs> Depending on how the numbers turn out, yes. So uh, I would, you know, the numbers may look bad, you know, and, and then we would have a different discussion. Well, I mean, that. and if it's a negative number, absolutely, that's a conversation. But if it's a positive number... And it's, I don't know, I'm just going to make numbers up. It's $50,000. And you're going to bring us recommendations to say, I think the money would be suited to go A, B, or C. Yes. And council will say, we want A, B, or C. 
and that's where the money goes. Yeah, we can do that. Is that the way we're going to do it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other, the next step, Chuck, of course, is we need to review the uh, resolution uh, 2008-135 on the financial policy to see if there's things we need to add, delete, update, etc. And that should come back to council at some point in time, Absolutely. probably prior to the mid-year mid-year review. Any objections? Did I forget anything? I have no objections. Yes, ma'am. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> recommendation. Any other recommendations? Okay. So thank you, Mr. Mount. Appreciate that item. Thank you. We now move to uh, item E, report on trips, re recent trips, meetings, and future meetings. And we're right at 428. So does anybody have any problem extending a little bit so we can finish up the agenda? Okay. Uh, I, will, I will mention that uh, we had a, a great... Uh, uh, wake up Sierra Vista this morning. Uh, and, good morning, Sierra Vista. Uh, good morning, Sierra Vista this morning. I wasn't awake yet. So. Uh, but we had uh, Jason Denno, who is with the University of Arizona South, talk specifically about the uh, the cyber training program that the University of Arizona has here, as well as at the university, a great uh, potential economic uh, development driver. I would remind everybody that it's on Friday at 7 is the change of command out on post where we say goodbye. Uh, to General Barrier and his wife, and welcome um, General General Walters, I believe his Walters. name is Walters. Walters. So, so uh, please, uh, hopefully everybody's RSVP, and I hope to see you out there. Anything else on recent trips, meetings, and future meetings? This is this is not my meeting, but I did want to put Chief Thrasher on the spot, and maybe he can share what he did last night. That's it doesn't sound. Uh, is yes. that for publication? <laughs> is that for publication, Chief? Come wow. on. <laughs> last night I attended uh, Congresswoman Woman's Market Martha McSally's uh, first responder of distinction award ceremony. And I am uh, pleased to announce that uh, Lieutenant Murdy Stompro was selected for first place for the individual award for the first responder distinction for the second congressional district last night. Yes. And please, please pass our congratulations on to Lieutenant Stompro. And when we have the opportunity, I know the council members are going to go shake his hand and pat him on the back. I think Thank you. We okay. Make him stand up and we, yeah, we probably should bring him and embarrass him yeah, in front of the council too. That. Yeah, he please do that. He really yeah, enjoys I'm, that. I'm <laughs> requesting that. I'm requesting it be done at the next well, council yeah, meeting. Yeah, some, some officers, you don't want to stroke their ego like that, but maybe Mr. Starbro can handle it. I don't he know. He can handle it. Any, anything else on that item? No. Okay. Um, Board. Mayor, I just, it's not, uh, again, not about my trip, but I did notice that the newspaper said, first of all, that y'all went to D.C. last week, and I don't think... It was earlier than that. Um, but it also said a trio of you went, and I noticed in the picture that Colonel Wright was there. So it was it actually a quartet? Well, actually, <laughs> actually, the way it works is uh, the, the colonel, of course, can't go on the hill with us. Okay. So he was on his own. Most of the time. Most of the time at the conference, and the other, the trio was actually attacking the hill. Okay, but he did travel with you oh, guys. Well, he didn't travel with us. He traveled separately because he was in D.C. for another okay. another reason. But he accepted the and award. He was with us to there to be recognized and accept the award as part as because he is part of the community. Yes, he is. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I did attend a meeting this morning uh, on uh, behavioral health criminal justice. It's a meeting that's been ongoing for actually probably since the early 2000s and is just getting a new life now. But uh, And I, I don't have a lot to report about it except that the issues around folks with mental health issues and criminal justice, no surprise to anybody, are just mounting. And uh, there are folks out there looking for um, uh, solutions to the issues, uh, particularly the number of folks with mental health problems that are in jails. And uh, it it does seem, though, that the crux of the matter there is uh, the uh, finances to support programs that will help uh, help with that problem. So that's just another an interest area of mine. Okay. We're ready to move to board and commission updates. Last mm -hmm. night I got to attend the uh, Sister Cities Commission. Uh, they have already formed a, a private corporation for Sister Cities Corporation. They're waiting for the 501c3, so that's good news. And the reason I was there, though, was uh, they're planning uh, to host the statewide Sister Cities uh, Convention here on the uh, 7th of October, right? It was the 7th? 7th, 6th, 7th. 6th, 7th, October. Two days. And uh, uh, so they were doing part of the planning, and that should be a, should be a great event. Uh, anybody else on commissions, boards and commissions? 
I attended West End last night too. Um, and uh, they're very active in wanting to improve things on the West End. I, they were happy to report, and I think uh, some folks are aware that the mural on um, the building, I don't know what building that is, you know, uh, the mural that's being painted yeah, it's facing beautiful. Buffalo. So, what is it? Century Link. Telephone It's coming. almost complete. <laughs> And I hope uh, we're going to do something to say hello to that that new mur mural, and um, and I'm sure Rosie is in touch with uh, the chair of that commission, with you, Matt, and with Victoria, and probably you too, <laughs> Sharon. Um, but to talk about a couple of other businesses that are looking at doing murals on the West End, and my only comment to that was they, there should be some coordination about those, even though they're on private buildings. Uh, to see if we can't have some sense of, um, what's the word, that there's some coordination among all the posters, uh, all the murals, so that they're not just willy-nilly any, anything up. I do know that one that's being looked at with um, one of the banks is uh, has to do with the Buffalo Soldier, but I just encourage um, Rosie as she talked to um, private companies that they, they do come together some kind of a way to be sure that the posters, uh, the, the murals all reflect something about Sierra Vista. And one thing I didn't know about is um, that there's a big railroad history in Sierra Vista. Is that something that uh, the city has has recognized or discussed? Or well, actually, actually uh, that, the railroad history is not as big here as it is in Benson. Okay. And essentially, there were a lot of spur lines that came into the post, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure exactly what additional okay. additional assets are there. Okay, I, unless I you're just, a real ra railroader and get excited about that stuff. I went to look into that because I thought it sounded interesting, and um, they're already making plans for the West End Fair, and um, that's about it for now. Okay, are we ready to go to future discussion items and and council requests? Any more? Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I would like to request, I believe I brought this up before. Mary, you can tell me if I already have requested this to be on the agenda, that we talk about having, first of all, the CHIP presentation from the County Health Department. If the they're, um, that's the uh, county assessment um, health surveys, assessment. Part, health assessments health assessment surveys, that were yeah. done. And this is going to fit into the area of... Um, on our strategic plan D3 that had to do with healthy living, healthy lifestyles. And um, so I would like to have them do a presentation. I haven't talked to them about a date or anything yet. But following that, and this is something I'd like to have the council discuss, uh, their interest level on having perhaps a monthly uh, brief presentation from a community agency that's serving our citizens in some service area whether it's um, the justice system or uh, food banks or um, agencies that are serving our citizens that who um, can tell us what, what the general condition is in our community. I wouldn't be so against that. I'd like to have it on an, um, a schedule, and I'll, I'll do a more formal. And, that, and the thing there is determine... Uh, which agencies, uh, how much time we're giving them, and then are they are we willing to do that at a w regular work session, or are we going to have a special special meeting where it'll be a, basically an open, essentially an open house type type of forum where they can come in and we can bring in other folks that may be interested to talk to the council about that way. So the, there's some there's some discussion that needs to go okay. on to figure out what we, how, how we how need to, to do, do that. it. Yeah. I will say I've asked a few agencies would they see a value in informing the council on what's going on in their particular agency vis-a-vis -vis our citizens. And uh, they are interested. Uh, I did make it clear this isn't about funding. Uh, this is more about just improving Education. our uh, knowledge about what's going on in the community. Okay, anybody else? I did want to add quickly that the Arizona Commission on African American Affairs good, good will point. be in town on July 20th. They host traveling board meetings throughout the state. They'll, the board meeting will be in the council chambers from 2 to 4, and then afterwards they will be hosting a town hall that's open to the public from 5 to about 7. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Seeing nothing else, we'll see everybody on Thursday. Thank you.